like I was taking cocaine when I was playing at Exeter. Just never got obviously caught or drug tested. But it wasn't every weekend, but it would have been like the odd time. Um <clears throat> and then obviously injuries got concussed in a European Cup game against La Rochelle and that was it. That was the last game of rugby I played. So then it was like moving back to Belfast from Exeter. And I'd been out of the rugby circles in, in Northern Ireland and Belfast for so long. So I didn't really have a support network as such there. And I didn't really have, I moved away from Exeter so they couldn't really keep in touch with the boys that were here. So I sort of went back to Belfast, I sort of been on my own. And I was living with my sister. Um, and her, like, she had a young family at that stage and I was just living in her spare room. I had no house because I lost everything through the divorce. Like apartments, house, everything was gone. Nothing to fall back on. And I just, I'd had a bit of money like that Exeter had given me as a bit of a, like, like a severance package, whatever you want to call it, for my retirement. And I just started to like smash my way through that with like partying and like again it was running away from everything that was that was was going on in my life, you know, like at that time, like so I was really struggling like with my identity, you know. I, I felt like I was this rugby player for so long. That's that's the big rugby player, and then now it was like I'm not that anymore. So then I was like, right, who am I? Didn't really have a clue who I was. I had no prospects of what I was doing going forward. And then I started to fall in with guys who would be going out on the weekends and meeting people on weekends and going out. And then I guess maybe my image, they liked that image of me at that time. You know, short hair, tattoos everywhere, muscles, like, you know. And... I just sort of fell in with these guys and like and like not saying that they're bad guys, like they weren't bad guys, but what they were they were they're lost too, you know, they were lost as well. And they just go down these wrong ways of doing things, like you know, so money was though I'm like, right, how can I get money? So I started to get involved with maybe, you know, selling bits of of, of start off cannabis or going and picking up cocaine for somebody and dropping it somewhere else or you know things like this and then again as you get more further into it it's like this is all happening and I'm not really and before you know it you've gone so far and you're like how the heck did this happen you know so <clears throat> that started to go down I got down and they really like just a really low vibration existence where I was just taking a lot of drugs and selling bits of drugs to get by and then you know just had no direction um and so ended up i got arrested i was starting to get in a bit of trouble with police you know like getting lifted for different things possession of class a drugs or you know, possession of cannabis and things like that. And I was going down and every time I was going down in the Musgrave station, which is like in Belfast City Centre. And it was happening more and more often. And there was one incident where I'd crashed my car and drove away because I was under the influence at the time. And I got to my house and, like, I knew the police would be coming. So, like, a threw my phone because my phone had loads of like evidence so, so I threw my phone into the bushes threw my car keys away and like ran back I don't know what I was doing bro like this was all under the influence you know mm. running to my friend's house and like trying to hide out there for a while and we were in his house and he was like bro you're going to have to go outside and I was like why and he's like looking out the window and he's like bro there's like 40 cops out there Drug, dogs, guys with rag gear on, all looking for me because they've heard reports. This guy's massive. He's like, mm. you know, and they sent like dog units and stuff to get me. And I walk out of the house and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, get down, get on the floor. And I'm like, I have really bad hips. I can't get. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was waiting on the hip replacements, you know. I'm like, God, I, I can't get in the floor. If I get in the floor, I can't get back up. And they're like, get down. And I was like, right, okay. Go. And then, uh, you know, went and then ended up not being able to get, because I've been in so much trouble, right, with the law over the the year before that, but not so much trouble, but just loads of little things, like loads of little court appearances with possession of drugs or different things, right? So then they were like, you're not getting a, a county court date. You're you're going to have to wait on high court, so you're going to have to go to McGabry Prison and wait your time there and on remand until you can go in. And I ended up being there for the first time. I think it was like four weeks. Um... And it was the first night, no, it was the second time I was there, that on the first night, the second time I was there, <clears throat> I tried to take my own life, um, in the, in the, in the prison, I was in a cell of my own, and, uh, the, I just remembered sitting there, and, like, at this stage, it was all withdrawals from, like, tablets, I was taking, like, codeine tablets, opiates, you know, and that all started through the pains, right? But then I got really addicted to these things. So I was having, I was sitting in the cell and I was like having withdrawals from them and I was having withdrawals coming down off cocaine, you know, all this stuff and worried about my life. I was sitting and saying to myself, I was like, God, like, how has my life got here? Like, this is me now. You know, I didn't think that there was any way of me getting out of that situation. Rock bottom. Rock bottom, bro. Like, and I knew it was coming for a while. Like, this isn't just over a course of a couple of months. This was like a good while that this had all been building up. How long exactly? So from when so you retired? i say I retired and say like I would have been in jail, I'd say a year and a half, two years after. Fuck. You know, it was a really quick spiral, mm. but it was like... Like, like what I was saying, it's like these. You just go on and go on, and then until you poke your head up and say, "Hang on, how did I get here?" You know, from where I was. You know, I had a family and good career, and like everything. I had a house, I had apartments, I had, you know, everything I ever wanted. You know, but I, like, I think deep down, I still wasn't, I didn't, still hadn't found that real happiness that I want, that I've been searching for, you know. And then when all that left, it was just a big, you know, like a huge dump of like, God, what's, what is this? You know, so then that rock bottom and that cell, and that's when I, I got like uh, the curtains off the thing. And I'd looked up on how to do this before, you know, like I'd looked. I'd googled how do you do it, you know, how do you, how do you hang yourself or how do you do this and I got the curtains and I did it <clears throat> and I, next thing I woke up on the floor with like four guards over me and they had resuscitated me and brought me back around and the guy who had said, the guy who was the, the, S, the, the officer in charge that night said that he was sitting on the computer like he does every night he's like for some reason he goes something just told me to come down and check this cell and he said he opened the thing and he, i was just hanging off the the bunk and he came in and like resusc resuscitated me and like that's like when he told me that as well like it's like that just wasn't my time you know that wasn't because like I had all this stuff to do, you know what I mean? Mm. But you wanted it to be your time, it, it, yeah. I mean, because you hear that's the what cry I for said. help. I mean, yeah, it, it's more than that. It was more than that because like I was literally on my on my own. Like I was ready, I was gone, you know. And it was like I said, the guy said the next morning, they they brought me in to like you know there was a nurse and the head sort of officer, and they were like. um how do you feel today? And I was like, I don't even know. I just numbed everything. And I was like, like if it had been, if I had had a gun, I'd have been dead. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a cry for help. It was a real deal, you know. Like I didn't want to be here no more. Mate, but, so that's so sad. Yeah, a, but, a, a real shame. But like, there's and this is the thing, bro. There's like. This is not just exclusive, you know, like this is a massive problem now for a lot of 
uh, it's huge. It's epidemic mm. level, though. Yeah. You know, for men, especially at home in Northern Ireland, it's crazy numbers. It's like that Northern Ireland's the highest number of suicide in the, in Europe. You know, so it's like there's there's things needing to be done, and I honestly believe that I went through this to be able to do what I'm doing now, so I can speak to guys. I can. I've got people come in to me now and speak, and I'm like, bro, I know exactly where where you are right now. You know, I know exactly what you're going through because mm-hmm. I've been there, but you can get through it, and it's just allowing people, giving people that, you know. A wee bit of knowledge and not and a wee bit of support. It's not help. It's like supporting people through, you know, and ways to get themselves through it. Mm. You know, that's like I think I, that's that's my purpose now. That's what I'm really. That's my whole thing now is to help people get to where I'm at. Mm. 